basically getting rid of the centers, the assembly became nothing more than a rubber stamp. And so, let's get this down. President Louis Napoleon more and more pushed the idea that the Second Republic should be hereditary. We should try to keep it in a common aristocracy. And who better in the aristocracy than him? I'm a Napoleon. And so he had a plebiscite. He had a plebiscite. Can we turn the Second Republican Republic into a hereditary monarch? Now, it's a coup, but it's one of these coups that's done very carefully, neatly. There's no military force. It's just, hey, all of you that owe your job to me, do you want to keep your job? Support me as emperor. And what do they say? Yes. I don't agree with emperor, but I like my job. Remember a plebiscite. That's a yes or no vote. Remember Napoleon had those all the time? And what did people rule? Dissenters are now afraid. Everybody wanted security, and Napoleon was overwhelmingly voted in as a hereditary ruler of the Second Empire, or I'm sorry, the Second Republic, and very quickly, I'm gonna put it in there. What happened is, once he got voted in, with this plebiscite, he announced a new French Empire. And he made himself, and this is what we have to get, Emperor Napoleon III. Napoleon had a son, and so, so he was technically Napoleon II. He is now Emperor Napoleon III. And so, think about the, iron, the irony of this. Overthrowing an absolute monarchy back in February, or, or not even an absolute monarchy, but a constitutional monarchy, but the monarchy had a lot of power to create a republic, Constitution Republic, and in that disruption, the Republic not only was created, but then voted itself out of office. That he's Emperor Napoleon the Third. Oh, that he a new empire, a new empire. The Republic is gone, and Napoleon would remain in power to eighteen seventy. At first, he would be incredibly popular. And then in the 1860s, the whole thing would fall apart on him. Until he would make foolish decisions, until finally deciding to declare war on Prussia, and it all be over. And so, that is France. So, at the same time, we have the revolution in France, 1848, February. The telegraph spread it very quickly all over Europe. New phenomenon. And so we go to the Habsburg Empire. The Habsburg Empire is Austria. And they had a new emperor in 1830, Ferdinand I. Now I put the picture up there of Ferdinand. He attempted to be a he attempted to maintain power over the Austrian Empire, but I put him in there because remember the pictures of the Habsburgs from Charles V, the Spanish Habsburgs? Yeah. That's why you don't marry your cousin. Do we got this? You can write this down. That's another. Actually, it doesn't mean it'll happen. Yeah, it may. But he was desperately trying, Ferdinand, to hold together this multicultural empire. And nationalism was growing. That's what Metternich was so concerned about. Metternich was not, Metternich did not care so much that France had a king. He wanted to make sure that we will support a French king so we can hold this. So Metternich was trying to hold together all these ethnic groups, and these are the major ones. It is just a hodgepodge of people. Now, the Habsburgs, their monarchy are Austrians, therefore they're German speakers. And so they're here. But they're only a, a tiny percentage, only about 25% of the population are Germans or is closely related to Germans. Now you notice something about this. Those are Germans. You notice they're here. You notice there's spots all over too. And so that's part of the way they try to control, divide and conquer. Put German groups in there to kind of hold it, support Germans moving around. Also other groups of Slavs moving around. They even encourage Jews to move around with the idea being that the more spread out it is, the easier to control. 
The problem, of course, is going to happen is when it finally does erupt in nationalistic fervor, it's going to blow the world up. World War I will begin here because of this. There's, there's lots of reasons, but that's the key trigger right there. And so Ferdinand's trying to hold this together. They had some issues in 1830, issues in the late 1830s, and then boom, news of Paris. They're like, hey, we can do this too. And where did it start? Hungary. The Hungarian Revolution or the Magyar Revolution. Same deal. News on the telegraph hit. Yes, let's go to re or let's have our own nationalistic state. Nationalism. And this was very a romantic idea. Wouldn't it be great? We could do this. Everybody will follow us. They'll see that we're right. Of course, it's going to be much more complex than this because just look at this map here. There are Germans who live here, Hungarians all over, Transylvania. But we just did a thing. We're doing 50s horror movies and uh, special topics and a little bit about the history of horror movies. And we just saw some things on uh, the original Dracula. Have you seen that? Good movie. But right here, they're not all Hungarians there either. They just show it in purple there, but there are Poles who live there. There are um, Bohemians, Czechs who live there. There are Croatians who live there and a significant Jewish population. But back to this. It started in hung Hungary, and in Budapest, Louis, now that's the actual pronouncing of Louis, but it's Louis Kosov. Now that's Leos, but it would come to the French and English, and Louis. And he would be this romantic figure of revolution who would spread this idea that we need an independent Hungary. To meet the aspirations of the Hungarian people, we can no longer be subservient to Germans who very much disrespect us. And the legacy of that goes on today. In Budapest, in Hungary, when people will toast, and you think about toast, you clink glasses, you don't even know what I'm talking about. Not in Hungary, because that's what the Austrian Germans did. They would clink glasses. So it's actually rude. It's almost like giving someone the finger. To clink your glasses. We were told that, and, and so I didn't do that. I didn't want Gary to that. So March 30 began after the news of Paris arrived. And very nationalists, as we said before, and what they immediately did is they rose up, the Austrians there fled, and they created a new republic, a representative government with an assembly. We will write a constitutional monarchy. Independence. Kosovo was successful. The freedom fighter. I mean, it happened literally overnight. You know, the Austrians did not. You know, they relied upon a combination of you know tradition or inertia. You know, it's always been that way, and the threat of force. And Hungarians who just agreed, and boom, it just just the whole thing fell. By the way, this was terrifying the Austrians for the next six, seventy years. Just like that. And the Hungarians took power. And so, what did they decide to do? Naturally invade Austria. Why? Nobody knows. Basically what happened was in the assembly was like, well, we better make sure that the Austrians don't come here. So, we don't even really have a government. We don't have a constitution. All we have, the army, the military, is basically the remnants of the Austrian army who fled, you know, these guys. Let's go invade Austria. And we'll get Vienna, and so they can't invade us. And once they did that, the whole thing fell apart. You see the same thing in Germany. They created independent states. What did they decide to do? Invade Denmark. Why? Heck, it almost blew up the American Revolution. The United States was literally just starting re revolting. And what did they decide to do? Invade Canada, which is British Canada, and got crushed. Fortunately, you know, since I like the United States, we survived. But just barely. We, I was a young man then. <laughs> ah, the paper. Thank you. Green metal. Yeah, you yeah. Oh, there's like, there's like, there's like a bunch on the page. Anybody else want one? <laughs> yeah, the exciting 
the daily ripping off of the stickers. <laughs> it would become a ritual. Soon it would be, you know, I like mark their what people march through, find the uniform, changing up the guard. <laughs> Anybody else? Last chance. Yeah, there were three on that one page. Oh, they're marginal. Oh, well, the invasion of uh, the invasion of Austria was a disaster, and this began to immediately disrupt everything. Arguments in the new assembly, different ideas, and just like in France, are we going to be bourgeoisie or not? Are we going to be more of a bourgeoisie or more socialist? But then the big thing was, within Hungary, you have all these other different national groups. And the Magyars, the Hungarians, don't necessarily agree that we're all one place. In fact, in Budapest itself are two separate cities, Buda and Pest, I guess is technically, and they fight all the time. And so they all begin to break apart. Are we going to be socialists? Are we going to be these, this more uh, bourgeoisie? Are we going to be, where are we going to represent all the other different little groups? And the thing just begin to collapse under its own weight. This happens a lot. You know, it kind of happened in the French Revolution, didn't it? That's where it devolved into the terror. And so once that happened, the Austrians who were revitalized, along with help of the Russians, 200,000 Russians, actually 100,000, sorry, 100,000, they, they invaded and crushed the rebellion. Kosovo would be arrested, but eventually let go. They didn't want to make them to a martyr. But Hungarian nationalism would fall apart. And in 1867, though, when the threat of this happened again, Austria, 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 where Austria would become a dual monarchy, Austria and Hungary. So it would be two kingdoms to give Hungary equal status to make sure this doesn't happen again. Now, the king's going to be Austrian, but it's going to be a dual monarchy. That's where you get... Austria would become Austria-Hungary, or something to say the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It's still technically Austria. But when World War I began, and you'll see it right there, if you look at that map after the Congress of Berlin in 1878, which we'll get to in a couple weeks, that's where you get the Austro-Hungarian Empire right here. Austria. And so they would eventually do that to try to keep it together. Did it work? You know, for, for uh, 60 years. And then World War One, it all fall apart. Now, part of the reason why they had some success is those telegraph lines went to Vienna too. And in Austria, they began to form their own militias and national guards. And in 1848, it happened in Vienna too. The February Revolution spread to Vienna, just like in Austria. March 13, ten days after Budapest. Couple weeks or three weeks after the February days in France, Vienna revolted. Students formed these their own militias. They marched throughout Vienna, demanding a constitution, demanding a republic, at least a constitutional monarchy. Ferdinand totally panicked. He had no support. But one of the big is when he fled. Well, I'm sorry. When Metternich fled. Metternich realized they're after my head, and he fled to Bavaria. When he fled, the empire collapsed. Ferdinand ran away. Vienna was taken over by soldiers. A new assembly. And once again, it was this very romantic idea. You know, people are like, we are finally going to create this perfect world. What's the perfect world? Well, then we fight about it. I, and that, basically what it is, the perfect world is arguing about what the perfect world would be. That's probably why there's no one's ever created that perfect world, except for, of course, here in Montana, right? <laughs> Eastern Montana, it's more perfect than we have in the circle. All right, so they created a, an assembly. They called it the Constituent Assembly. Constituent basically means of the people. The people will decide. And once again, a new republic. Same deal, though, what type of republic? Are we going to be just a very basic constitution with, even though we're guaranteed rights, for the most part, the, the middle class will be in charge, or there will be socialism? And a couple things they did. First off, they abolished serfdom, finally. 
serfdom there was called the robot. This we mentioned before. Now, serfdom was mostly in the fringes of the empire, but ironically, as serfdom ended in the west because of the plague, it actually picked up in the east. But then it began to be divided over how liberal are we going to be? Are we going to go all the way to socialism? Are we going to be more and more conservative? Just allow the power to a few more of the aristocracy and immediately bog down. By the way, why the long nose? Yeah, the whole thing about long nose in line was a pretty old tradition. And so, not just Pinocchio. But I like that picture. And they divided once again. Ferdinand fled the country, but here's what happened. Russia. Russia, which had their own Decemberist revolt back in 1825, Russia did not have these problems, partially because the telegraph line didn't reach St. Petersburg yet, but also because nobody dissented or they'd be sent to Siberia. And so it kind of you know, eventually they'll blow up, but it kept the revolution down. And so, a couple things happened. First off, Franz Ferdinand was replaced, and his young nephew, Franz Joseph, would become emperor. He was very conservative. And look at the dates he would be emperor. Oh. He would spend the rest of his life doing everything he could to hold this thing together. And he'd be the emperor when World War I would begin. He would die and replaced by Franz, but not Franz. Uh, it's gone, I can't remember. It'll come back to me in a second. He's really going to bug me. Someday you too will be old. <laughs> but the plan of the conservatives were divide and conquer. Divide the different nationalities. Support one, you know, first come and support the Germans. Say, I'm the only one to protect you from the evil Hungarians. And then go against others and divide and just try to keep these groups bickering so we can take power. Now, in the short run, this can work. In the long run, it's going to blow up. And it will blow up. But he will maintain control. But what really helped were the Russians. Tsar so Nicholas I, now remember him, he used to want to go for the Decemberists. And originally he was relatively open to a few liberal reforms, and then the Decemberists happened. No! He raised and marched across over a thousand miles a 400,000 man army. And I can't even begin to tell you what a big deal this was. Part of the reason why Russia was always seen as this just awesome power and soon be known as this Russia, either they would show it like an octopus, just so big, and then eventually the steamroller, which would become prominent the, in the middle of the century. A 400,000 man army, just we're going to march a thousand miles to support an empire in Austria so the revolution doesn't spread. That's power. 4,000 men, that's a, that's a lot of people. And they just took off marching across in the middle, uh, at the, in the fall into the winter. And with this 400,000 men army, they helped Ferdinand take control. Sorry, they helped Ferdinand regain control. Oh, not Ferdinand, did I say Ferdinand? I'm sorry, Franz Joseph take control. And using that, and then now you have 400,000 men. And with that, 100,000 men would go to, 100,000 men of that would go back and take over Hungary, and the rest of it would come in, and then eventually Italy. Russia would decide to make sure this revolution is tamped down. Also, there's a revolution in Bohemia, and Bohemia is today, what country? What country is Bohemia? Indiana. Bohemia, those are the Czechs. Those are the Czechs. And they too revolted. And similar deal. And what they were talking about were there are more and more of these two national identities. Slavs 
and Germans. Bohemians are Slavs. And pan essentially means all, all Slavs. And what they, this began was, let's make a pan-Slavic state. So the Germans can have their pan-German state. And so, we'll see this again, pan-Slavism, pan-Slavism, and it'll really get its start here. At first it was a romantic idea, then it would become a much more violent idea. And in Prague they met, and in this, the concept of, we'll create a kingdom with this concept of, we are Slavs, but special Slavs. So Austro-Slavism. You can see a problem that's going to happen all, already. We're not those kind of these laws, like, like the Poles, or the Croats, or the um, Slovaks. We're special Slavs, the Austro-Slavs. Once again, this national identity thing. But of course, the Austrian army crushed it with the help of the Russians. And this is a drawing of, in Prague, the barricades were set up. Bridge in the middle of Prague, very, a symbolic spot, and eventually here they are being put down by the Austrians. It even happened in Romania, I won't worry about Romania for this one, but the point is it spread throughout the Austrian Empire, but in Italy. Italy is one of the places of really big revolution. There is Italy in 1848. Now the Papal States still dominated here, and these are independent states here, the Piedmont of Sardinia, usually they'll be called the Kingdom of Sardinia, even though it's technically Piedmont's more correct. And for reasons no one has ever really fully explained, this is the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Why this is Sicily, I don't know, but it's the Kingdom of Two Sicilies. They're a Bourbon monarchy, so that means they're distantly related to the old French Bourbon monarchy, the 16th, etc. And the Austrians dominate here, but also have a lot of influence here. One more thing, the French. The French have always kept soldiers in the Papal States. Not always, but they've kept them since the 1830s, basically to ensure that that remains independent. Italy was not an independent place. The concept of Italy was a very romantic idea. Let's have an Italy. And so, boom, France happened, telegraph line, but also this. Austria had significantly raised the tobacco tax combined with the presence of Austrian soldiers to support the tax. Now, all right, bad enough. Food is expensive, but now tobacco's more expensive. And then revolution hit. Paris, it spread to Italy. And these romantic guys like Mazzini we'll get to in a second. Now is the time. And so, nationalists and liberals all over rose up. They rose up against the French, they rose up here, but also against the Bourbon monarchy here, which they always seen as not Italy, not Italian. The point is the rising of national feeling. Now, there's a big problem. They're gonna have this the entire history of Italy to this day. They don't feel like the same country. And so the idea that Naples is like Milan made no sense to anybody who actually lived there. It's like, wouldn't it be great if we all just kept back together? And if you go there today, you tell Naples is like a totally different world than in Genoa, let's say, or Milan. It's just like, it's weird how much different it is. Well, what happened was, in a series of revolts, the Bourbon monarchs had to flee Naples and the House of Savoy. Now, we'll get to the Savoy monarchy, but there were Sardinians. They Seeing this happen, seeing Austria, seeing Ferdinand flee, <coughs> Metternich flee, let's declare war. In fact, Austria, you can kind of get this feeling that they, everyone's out to get us. Attitude. And so, here's Sardinia. They declared war here. The Bourbon monarch fled. Now is the time. And there's marching on Rome. And so, Mazzini, Giuseppe Mazzini, who is like the heart, the romantic heart, of Italian nationalism. He marched on Rome. The French fled because of their own revolution, and helping him was a soldier of fortune who's become one of the great kind of, he's a dashing, once again, using that term, because it is, romantic figure, 
of Giuseppe Garibaldi. And Garibaldi, his followers would eventually wear red shirts, the Red of Revolution. We talked about that before. The red shirts. They marched into Italy, they marched into Rome and declared a Roman Republic. I'm sorry, an Italian Republic out of Rome. And the Pope fled. This is big. This is really big. Part of the reason the Pope was always opposed to nationalism and liberal ideas is because they realized if people start thinking for themselves, the church will lose even more power. You know, the church is going to be intensely conservative. And so, what happened is, though, once again, they bogged down in fighting with the Mazzini in charge, with Slovenia, and that's when the Austrians march back. General Radetzky is going to be one of the great Austrian heroes, great as in very Austri hero austro hungarian empire, great as in important. They marched into Italy, but half of his army were Russians. The same Russians that marched to help put down the revolt in Hungary, to put down the revolt in Austria, put down the revolt in Bohemia. They marched into Italy, killed them, crushed them, crushed them. Italian nationalism was stopped right there. Italian nationalism was stopped right there. The French, after Napoleon, one of the big things um, Napoleon III would do, actually, it's still Louis Napoleon. The French sent forces back into Rome. The Pope was allowed back in, and nationalism ended. Now, that is going to be the dynamic for Italy now for the next 15 years. The Austrians are still in the north. The Bourbon monarch was reestablished back in the south. The French are in Rome. So, Italy did not happen. But once again, oh, almost forgot. Victor Emmanuel would become the new king of Sardinia after they were routed by the, by, by the Austrians. And the thing about Victor Emmanuel II, his goal, the reason he could maintain the throne was he had one purpose, a unified Italy. Under whom? Unified Italy under Victor Emmanuel. I'm going to unify it. So, out of this is going to come Italian unification. All right, now Germany. Germany, and that is going to be the symbol of German unification, German liberty. And there's a huge statue of this in Koblenz on the Rhine River, this massive statue, a little bit gaudy. It looks a little bit like your first class, like a Statue of Liberty. You get closer, it's like, no, it's something different about it. Because it became part, very much part of German nationalism. Well, remember back in 1834, the Prussians created the Zollverein, and the Zollverein was that economic union of northern Germany. And this was an important step to German independence. Prussia and Germany were competing with each other, sorry, Prussia and Austria were competing with each other for domination of the German states, and Prussia had the hands, uh, uh, Prussia had a uh, as the bank because of the Zolper. And it's basically going to encompass this area here, economic union. Austria is not allowed. Boom, revolution, 1848. And same deal. Let's create a unified Germany. Oops. Well, Frederick William IV was the king of Prussia. And he, he, because he, he believed in, in this new scientific world that's being created, industrialization is hitting the German states, and he believed in fairies and elves and uh, dark powers, and basically he was known as being mad as a hat. And this is going to be a problem because everybody knew the guy was crazy. And so we have an unstable monarch in Prussia at a time when they were trying to take domination. Prussia, the goal of the state was to take domination of all of Germany. <laughs> and he was intensely anti-liberal. He believed he was like King Arthur's uh, uh, reincarnation of King Arthur. And so he, and he did believe that there were all these mystical powers. And he was an interesting man. He's crazy. 
Pam, the big thing are, he relied, remember the Uyghurs, the aristocracy, he needed their support. I chose that picture carefully because it doesn't look so calm and rational there. Well, what happened was, 1848, Paris, boom, it spread to Germany. And in Frankfurt, in the German Confederation, an assembly was created. Liberals and Romantics made up the ball. But remember, liberals at this time included the new bourgeoisie, the new middle class, and socialists. They all were together. And this idea is we can come together, hold hands, and come together with a state. And by the way, I'm saying that because you hear people today talk about that all the time in the United States. They'll come to it. Can't they see? Well, they all agreed that we need, they needed some kind of constitution. After that, they couldn't come together. They couldn't agree what the real problem was. If you can't agree what the problem was, you can't agree with the solution. But they called this a German confederation of the boot. And that's where you get today the, the German Republic that is the Bundes, the Bundesrat of the Bundes Republic. The Bund just means confederation. And it will be this confederation of German states. Now, I put this up there because technically the confederation includes Prussia and Austria. So we have two really powerful states and then the rest of the smaller states of Germany. And what they decided this assembly, there would be universal suffrage. Suffrage means the right to do what? And who is, when I mean universal, I'm talking about who can vote. It's not really universal. Who? Men, only men. Yeah. And this seems frustratingly slow, but there is one real, realistic, or uh, one um, little bit of realism. You can't get to everybody voting until you, until you have some people vote. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't quit fighting. And most of the delegates, though, because they could afford to be there, were this new German middle class of industrialists. The Junkers fell out of it, and many of the socialists fell out. So there's already going to be a divide there. But one big thing, <coughs> who would be allowed in? Would it be the Austrian Habsburgs or the Prussian Hohenzollerns? Would it be Frederick William? Or would it be Ferdinand slash Franz Joseph? Now, Prussia had a big advantage. Yes, Berlin would erupt just like Vienna, but Frederick William never lost control. Vienna, they lost control. So Prussia is in a much better position. And so, that's the assembly. And you'll notice the new German flag was created, the German Confederation. Gold, black, and red. And that is the flag of Germany today. And it's going to be created in the, the uh, 1848, or the 1848 uh, convention. Black and red, and that's also the color of, the, of Prussia. And so when Prussia would make this into a, a German empire under Prussia, they would be red, white, black. And then after World War I, they go back to this flag. And then for, for very conscious reasons to go back to this empire, Nazi Germany would go back to red, black, and white. Then after World War II, both East and West Germany would adopt this flag and now it's that flag. And so, here is the same deal as Vienna. These citizen militias formed up here is in Berlin, down in Frankfurt, Hamburg, but Munich, all over to protect this new republic. But of course, they disagreed on everything. First off, what kind of state are we going to have? Who's going to be in charge? Who's going to be elected? What type of constitution? And so, first off, Berlin almost immediately tried to take control over the Frankfurt Assembly. And they had a big advantage because the Frankfurt Assembly decided what's the best way to spread this rebel or to maintain this new constitutional monarchy and invade Denmark. So they invaded Denmark. And Prussia said, let us do it. We'll invade. We want those states too. And almost immediately, just like what happened in Hungary, it began to dissolve because of the war. <laughs> it is fascinating. We're a weak new republic 
What's the best way to strengthen it? Invade somebody. Happens a lot. Let's get to the last thing. I didn't quite go as far as I wanted, but once again, once that happened, the liberals were split apart. We should invade. Let them have their own revolution. No, we must free them. No, we must force them to become part of the state. And Britain and Russia actively opposed. And once that happened, the revolution began to bog down. Okay, got a little bit left to finish tomorrow. There'll be a quick little essay question about the beginnings of the revolution and the backlash. I do get the backlash is all conservative. And reading assignment. Please read 734 to 743 by Friday. So basically through Italian and German unification. I'm forgetting something. What am I forgetting? <laughs> so basically, it's a And it's just going to be a question. We'll come in, go, do it. You got literally go. a couple minutes. That's it. But think about it. And even though obviously we're not doing the full essay, it'd be a good idea to do a couple things for brainstorming to think about what you would write your essay about. Something to tie together. <laughs> Have a good day.